She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. Now this is a special edition of Coffee and Crime Time because we aren't going to be talking about a specific case today instead and in preparation for a series I'm releasing this month, we're going to discuss the elusive mystery of what makes a person a serial killer. Are they born? Are they made? Are they a combination of both nature and nurture? Is there a biological component along with a psychological one? Can a serial killer be cured or fixed? Or will they always have an impulse to hurt and kill? I've already done several series on different serial killers. It's called the Serial Killers series. <laughs> We've talked about Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. We've talked about Carla Hamoka, Paul Bernardo. We've talked about Andrew Cunanan and many others. And my next series is going to be on one of the most notorious serial killers in Britain, Dennis Nilsson. With Nilsson's situation, there's a lot going on. And he wrote an autobiography where he tells his own story, which I read. Some of what he says is true. Some of it's not. You know, some allegations can be proven while others can't. But it got me thinking as I was reading the words of someone who's clearly a deeply disturbed individual. What even is a serial killer? And how are they classified? How can you tell if someone falls under that category? And most importantly, how does someone even become such a thing? And the truth is, there's no conclusive answer to this. But over the years, many scientists, experts, and historians have formulated some really interesting and amazing theories. Many of these theories overlap and tie into each other. So I thought it would be beneficial for us today, before we dive into Dennis Nilsson's story and the case, if we went through like a crash course on serial killers, the science, and the theories, all of it. Now, I know in the last video I said that um, there was going to be some more coffee and crime times this month. The, the problem is I, I like to have a lot of details, and I've been following a lot of cases that are current and ongoing, and there's just not enough details to make a fully fleshed out video, and I have a very hard time making a non-fully fleshed out video. So I would ask you guys to put in the comments cases that you think, even if they've happened like in the past two years or five years, cases you think where there's enough information that we can make at least you know an hour-long video, but it's not too much information where it would have to be a deep dive, because coffee and crime times are usually more current cases, uh, cases where there isn't a ton of information, but they're still important to talk about. So throw some options in, you know, the comments section. But after this video, I am launching into a multi-part serial killer series about Dennis Nelson, and uh, I'm very excited about it. And this video is going to be hugely important to that series. So I hope that you watch this and the series because I was going to put all of this stuff in the beginning of Dennis Nelson's series, but it would have made it really long and, you know, it just doesn't necessarily have to do with Nelson himself. It has to do with many other people and many other notorious serial killers. So I really kind of wanted to have it on its own, almost as like a, an outline to the things that we're going to be looking for when we go over Nelson and his background and his childhood and his life and his behavior so that we can kind of refer to this video and reference this video when we're trying to figure out exactly where he fits into the serial killer spectrum. But before we dive in, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. So imagine I'm doing the research for this video and imagine 
not only the stuff that I type into the search bar, but the crazy places on the internet that those searches bring me to. Every single day, I am sitting at my computer looking up some of the most horrendous, most graphic stuff on the internet. I mean, there's pictures. It brings me, sometimes I follow links and I'm like, whoa, I didn't want to go here. I personally don't really want anyone out there knowing what I'm doing online. Um, Not my internet provider, not anybody who's going to like hack into my computer, nothing. Because A, it's none of their business. And B, it makes me look crazy, especially if you don't know what I do. Now, that's one of the many reasons a VPN is so imperative. And if you aren't using one already, you definitely should be. With Surfshark, you can surf the web in a clean cyber ocean with no ads, trackers, malware, or phishing attempts with clean web. Surfshark also has something called camouflage mode, which makes it so that even your internet provider can't tell you're using a VPN, and the internet should be open to everyone. That's why Surfshark offers no borders mode, which allows you to access content in restrictive regions. So I always use this example because it is the one that I think is most relevant to me and and to most people when you want to watch watch something on Netflix, but it's not available in your country, you can just switch the country in your VPN and you can watch it. When I'm watching March Madness, for some reason, Syracuse basketball games are usually blacked out in my region on Watch ESPN. You'll go in to watch it, you'll be so excited, and then they'll be like, no, it's blacked out. All I have to do is switch my region, and then I can watch the game. So it's it's really awesome. So it's not just for like protection, even though that is the most important part. It's also for like your entertainment and to make your life easier. Surfshark gives you the ability to protect your online privacy, control your personal data, and access your content safely. You can browse privately so no one can track or steal your data. You can hide your location so no one can track you. And you can stay safe on public Wi-Fi. You can also keep your searches private, which is something I really appreciate. And you can get real search results, which I have to say is invaluable to me in my research because I need unbiased and organic search results. What I don't need is the watered down versions that Google's always giving me or Google's like, you don't want to see this stuff. Let's give you something different. The depth of my research has gotten so much better since I've switched to a VPN, since I've started using Surfshark, because now I get the search results for everything. I don't just get, um, you know, the stuff that like Google wants me to see or the stuff that whatever the political climate is, Google Google's like, oh, we're not going to show them this. We'll show them this. It's just a pain. I don't like it. It makes my job so much harder. I used to have to switch between using Google and DuckDuckGo, and now I can just search for everything in one place. It's easier. It's faster. And honestly, they're better results. Everyone uses a VPN for a different reason. Some like to watch Netflix or other streaming services in different countries. Some want to protect their identity and financial information from hackers and you know various nefarious people out there with bad intention. Some don't want ads targeted to them based on what they look at online. I like to use a VPN for all of the above. Whatever the reason you choose to use a VPN for, Surfshark is the best and you can connect on unlimited devices, which is something that is much different than other VPNs and something I value. So not only can you use Surfshark on your own computer or your own device like your cell phone, your family can use it on all their devices as well. Your husband, your kids, your mom. Completely unlimited. Everybody's covered. All devices are protected. And if you're not completely satisfied, Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. Right now, viewers of this channel can get 83% off a two-year plan and three months extra for free. All you have to do is go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow and use code Stephanie Harlow. That's Stephanie with an E and Harlow with an E. Once again, go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow to get 83% off a two-year plan plus three extra months for free. Surfshark is a modern VPN designed with the user in mind. That means it's not complicated to use. Trust me, if I can do it, and I'm very technologically um, challenged, you can do it too. Surfshark protects its users in the open waters of today's internet. Everyone should be using a VPN, so go ahead, click the link in the description box, go to surfshark.deals slash Stephanie Harlow, and start protecting yourself today. Thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring this video, and let's dive in. So I'm not going to get into the specifics of Dennis Nilsson's case here. It's a crazy case, so I really hope you join me for the series But after he was arrested, Dennis Nilsson wrote a letter from prison, and in it he said, quote, I am always surprised and truly amazed that anyone can be attracted to the macabre. The population at large is neither ordinary nor normal. They seem to be bound together by a collective ignorance of themselves and what they are. They have, every one of them, got their deep, dark thoughts with many a skeleton rattling in their secret cupboards. 
Their fascination with types, like myself, plagues them with the mystery of why and how a living person can actually do these things, which may only be those dark images and acts, and they loathe anything which reminds them of this dark side of themselves. No one wants to believe that I am just an ordinary man come to an extraordinary and overwhelming conclusion. End quote. There are many scientists and researchers at the top of their fields who might agree with Dennis Nilsson that serial killers are born like anyone else, completely normal, a blank slate ready to be written on. But something goes wrong along the way, or something that possibly lives in all of us is activated in a very small percentage of people that go on to commit multiple violent acts of murder. Let's start with the basics. A serial killer is a person who commits a series of murders, usually three or more people, over a period of a month, often with no apparent motive and typically following a characteristic, predictable pattern of behavior. The term serial killer was coined in 1978 by an FBI agent named Robert Ressler in an attempt to put a name on those who obsessively and repeatedly killed, like Jack the Ripper, Ted Bundy, and Henry Lee Lucas. According to the FBI, there is no generic profile of a serial murderer. They kill in different ways. Their motives vary. They come from all walks of life. However, we have been able to identify certain traits that are common among serial killers, including psychopathy. Psychopathy is a personality disorder that is seen in people who use a mixture of charm, manipulation, intimidation, and occasionally violence to control others, and they do this in order to satisfy their own selfish needs. There are four factors to psychopathy, interpersonal, affective, lifestyle, and antisocial. Now, the interpersonal traits would manifest in the outward personality of a psychopath, they can be glib, which means they speak or behave in a way that seems almost too easy or insincere. They have superficial charm, a grandiose sense of self-worth, and they can be pathological liars with the ability to easily and thoughtlessly manipulate others. The affective factor refers to basically the psychopath's response to external stimuli and the world around them. They'll have a flat affect, and that means they do not express emotions in the same way that others do. They have very little facial expression. They may speak in a monotone voice. They have a lack of empathy and no personal responsibility. The lifestyle factor shows that many psychopaths gravitate towards stimulation-seeking behavior. They are impulsive, they are irresponsible, and they lack realistic life goals. They are also often antisocial, which is shown negatively in childhood, where they may get in trouble a lot because they have poor behavioral controls, and they don't feel as if they belong to the world that they see around them. But of course, psychopathy does not a serial killer make, not on its own. Many people who have psychopathic tendencies or they fall on the spectrum somewhere, they don't become murderers. It just so happens that many murderers exhibit psychopathic tendencies. In fact, I think I have a, a couple psychopathic tendencies myself, and I'm sure if, if you're all being honest with yourselves and you kind of look at what exactly constitutes who a psychopath is, you might say, yeah, like I see some of that in myself. The motives of a serial killer are often hard to determine for many reasons. A serial killer may have different motives for committing their crimes, and these motives may change and evolve very quickly sometimes. Sometimes they will evolve during the murder series. So a serial killer may have one motive when killing one person, and then the next person they kill, it's a different motive. Sometimes the motives can even change over the course of one single killing. One thing that most experts agree on, however, is that the serial killer wants to kill. They want to commit this murder. And law enforcement has been trained in these cases to not get too hung up on or focused on the specific motive because it may not make sense to anyone else. It may only make sense to the killer. And even then, the motive may be fabricated by the killer just to justify the killing because in the end, he or she really just wants to kill. Now, I said he or she, right? So let's talk about the elephant in the room before we go on any further. Serial killers are usually men. There are female serial killers out there. It does happen to be a little bit different, though, and that's a, a whole nother can of worms. I know I'm going to get people in the comments because oftentimes while I'm going through this video, I'm going to say he, 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 because serial killers are typically men. 
But I want you all to know that I'm not ignorant. I'm not new to the world. I understand that there are some female serial killers, like Eileen Warnos is the one that comes to mind. According to discoverymagazine.com, women account for just over 11% of all serial murder cases in the past century. So that is a small percentage. It's not something to, you know, overlook but it is much smaller. And even as numbers for male serial killers soared above 700 people in the 1980s, they remained relatively stable for women. So I do think that there's different etymology behind it. I think that there's different reasons. And uh, for the most part, what we're speaking about today, it really does apply to men, men serial killers. All right, so we've got a lack of empathy, a lack of emotional depth in general. A serial killer can feel and show empathy or love even for a person or an animal, but never for their victims. They're fully aware of the pain that they're causing. They're aware of the distress that their victims are experiencing, but they do not feel it. We know that many well-known serial killers have had pets that they loved very much, like John Wayne Gacy and the subject of our next series, Dennis Nilsson. Serial killers always have a lack of remorse, and it is suspected that even if they express remorse, which most never do, it's just another manipulation tactic. Impulsiveness is another hallmark of a serial killer. Many have expressed that they wanted to stop, that they would even make changes in their lives that they felt would be deterrents to them continuing their violence. They often comment that they felt they were not in control, that their impulse to kill again was so strong they could do nothing about it and they simply went along with it. This may be due to the fact that serial killers who are psychopaths do not feel emotions during their everyday life, but they do feel the pull of the urge, and they feel good. They feel better once they've given in and taken a life. So like a drug addict, they chase the high. They chase that fix that will finally allow them to feel something. I was drinking a lot during that time, and just, uh, I don't know, looking for something to, uh, some way to find some fulfillment, some some pleasure and I acted on my fantasies and uh, that's where everything went wrong. Many serial killers also share the trait of grandiosity. They see themselves as smarter than everyone else. They're above the law and they probably won't get caught because they're one step ahead of the rest of us. They can also be narcissists but it usually comes from a place of feeling inadequate and not accepted for their entire lives. But when they kill, they feel competent at something, maybe for the first time ever. And they will often read articles about their crimes and get off on seeing their deeds in print. We're going to examine several theories, but keep in mind, each one is just that, a theory. And they often expand upon each other, so it's best to look at them all together to better understand the mind of someone like Dennis Nielsen. In 1963, forensic psychiatrist John Marshall McDonald believed he had identified three factors that could predict whether or not someone would have the ability to commit murder. Known as the McDonald Triad, this theory lays out three main predictors of violent behavior, the first of which being cruelty to animals, which McDonald believed stemmed from a childhood of prolonged humiliation at the hands of others. This is especially true if the person doling out the abuse and humiliation is an adult in a position of power that the child cannot retaliate against. Instead, the child will take their frustration and anger out on something that is smaller and weaker than themselves, like a family pet or a wild animal. Research has shown that 25% of aggressive inmates had committed multiple acts of animal abuse as children. 45% of school shooters have histories of animal abuse and 21% of serial killers have admitted to childhood animal abuse. David Berkowitz, also known as the Son of Sam, killed his neighbor's dog, claiming he thought the animal was possessed by the devil. Jeffrey Dahmer killed multiple animals as a child, and he reportedly even impaled a dog's head on a stick and displayed it. You know how sometimes people who knew these killers, they're like, how could this happen? There was no sign that, that he would turn out like this. Well, that's a sign, okay? That's a sign. If, if your little neighbor Jeffrey is impaling a dog's head on a stick and displaying it, that's a sign. The Boston Strangler, Albert DeSalvo, would trap animals in boxes when he was a young boy, and then he would shoot arrows into the boxes so that these animals were trapped and they couldn't even get away and, like, save themselves. 
The second corner of the McDonald triad is fire setting, which McDonald suggested was a coping mechanism children could use to vent their feelings of aggression and helplessness. Setting fires is a way that children can show themselves that they still have power and control over something, something that's stronger than them. David Berkowitz was a well-known pyromaniac as a child. He even got the nickname Pyro from his childhood playmates. After his arrest, he confessed to setting dozens of fires around New York City, and it's believed that he may have been responsible for up to 1,400 fires. Lastly, McDonald believed that bedwetting in children past the age of five was an indication that the child might be prone to violent behavior as an adult. Wetting the bed would then exacerbate the feelings of humiliation and worthlessness that these kids already lived with every day. But since it's linked to stress and anxiety in small children, the bedwetting behavior would not stop. It would only get worse as the child became more stressed out and embarrassed by it adding to their feelings of inadequacy. Since Dr. McDonald's death, the understanding of human behavior has evolved, and many modern experts don't necessarily buy into the McDonald triad completely. They believe instead that the three factors, animal cruelty, pyromania, and bedwetting, are better indicators of a dysfunctional home environment and childhood trauma. However, childhood trauma, above any of the other similarities that serial killers share, is the most recurring theme in the lives of these people. Colin Wilson was an English writer, philosopher, and novelist who wrote many books on true crime before the genre was even a thing. He would write over 100 books in his life, including the Encyclopedia of Murder, co-written with Patricia Pittman in 1962. And this is an extensive volume of some of the most notorious and horrific murderers. It's a book that one critic called, quote, a banquet for those with that kind of appetite of perversion and atrocity, end quote. I feel very called out right now because I own this book. Wilson wanted to write this book to analyze the crimes philosophically and ask the question, can one learn anything from the study of murder? I think that the answer is yes. Wilson believed that crime was raw material that helped researchers and scientists understand the existential dilemmas of humans, such as how much do we value life? He once wrote, quote, It is precisely this knowledge of the value of life that the murderer lacks. But we all lack this knowledge, this total value. Only a few saints and mystics break through the hedge of daily trivialities to some partial awareness of the reality. Murder is a manifestation of the universal failure of values, end quote. Colin Wilson felt that serial killers were a fairly modern phenomenon and that they are primarily motivated by the need for self-actualization, the desire to fill some inner want, which expresses an individual's psyche. This is a theory that he explores deeply in his book, A Plague of Murder, The Rise and Rise of Serial Killing in the Modern Age also a book I own. Wilson felt that the reason a man would become a serial killer would be due to his self-esteem being so low that killing was a way to show that he existed. Many of these individuals, these serial killers, they're naturally dominant, but early on in their lives, they find themselves in situations that force them to be passive, and this leads them to feel repressed and irrelevant. Wilson goes on to say that there's also a desire to inflict pain that links many serial killers due to sadism present in their early lives, or the desire may have developed as a result of sexual obsession, like an early sexual obsession. Now, Colin Wilson was writing this book as the siege at Waco was happening at the Branch Davidian complex of David Crush and his followers. I have a multiple part series on that as well. I'll link it in the description box if you haven't seen it. Wilson uses the example of those who fall victim to the cult life. He says that people who find themselves in such situations, they're not stupid. They're usually intelligent, good people, but they're targeted at a time in their lives when they're in a state of emotional vulnerability or in the throes of some sort of loss or failure. And this puts them in a place where their self-worth and self-esteem are at an all-time low. And they're sort of actively looking for something that will give them the ability to exercise their power. Because the ability to act, to do something, to join a cult, it brings them psychological relief. It brings them, once again, a feeling of control. Wilson's belief that serial killers are a modern phenomenon is linked to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is a motivational theory in psychology that's comprised of a five-tier model of human needs, usually illustrated in the shape of a pyramid. And if anybody's taken Psych 101, 
in high school or college, you will recognize this. The basic needs of humans makes up the bottom of the pyramid. It's the the foundation. These are physical needs like food, water, shelter, the things that a person needs to actually like stay alive. Also included in the basic needs are safety and security, something that needs to be achieved before you can move up the pyramid and start focusing on psychological needs like belongingness, which includes personal relationships, friendships, a strong family unit, uh, a romantic interest, etc. Above that, there are esteem needs like self-worth, accomplishment, and respect. It's a need to respect yourself and the need for others to respect you as well, often achieved by gaining some sort of status or prestige. Maslow felt that the need for respect or reputation is most important for children and adolescents, and it comes before actual self-esteem and dignity. So you want others to love you, you want others to respect you before you can actually go ahead and love and respect yourself. At the highest level of the pyramid sits self-actualization, and this refers to the realization of your potential and self-fulfillment, which allows people to seek out personal growth and new experiences. At this level, a person will have a strong desire to accomplish everything they can, everything they were meant to accomplish, and they have a strong urge to become the best person they can be because they have the tools and the skill set now to transcend just living, just getting by. Colin Wilson wrote that when humans are at the bottom of the pyramid, they're mostly concerned with simply staying alive. They're not hard to please. He said, quote, A man who has been half-starved since birth feels that if only he could have three good meals a day, he would be ecstatically happy. But if this level of need is satisfied, the next emerges for security, a roof over one's head. If this level is satisfied, the next emerges, the sexual level, not just the need for sex, but for love, for companionship. And if this level is satisfied, the next need emerges, to be recognized and respected. In other words, the need for self-esteem. And if this level is satisfied, a final level sometimes, though not always, emerges, what Maslow called self-actualization creativity, not necessarily writing novels or symphonies, but the need to do something well merely for the sake of doing it well. Even stamp collecting counts as self-actualization, end quote. Wilson felt that a new level of crime was beginning to emerge because in the decades leading up to the 20th century, society itself had passed through Maslow's hierarchy of needs. He points out that in the 1700s, sex crimes were not all that common because criminals were too busy trying to just stay alive. These were tough times filled with famine and disease. There was never enough to go around. In the Victorian age, there was a higher level of prosperity, bringing society into Maslow's second level, and the crimes being committed also evolved. William points to American serial killer Bell Guinness, who was active in Illinois and Indiana between 1884 and 1908. Bell claimed that she didn't kill just to kill. She didn't even kill just for money. She did so because she craved a home and the security that having a home would bring. Society reached the third level, the need for relationships, sex, and companionship in the second half of the 19th century, and this is when we see sex crimes begin to emerge at a much more rapid pace. Wilson used Jack the Ripper to illustrate this change in society. Then we get to the 1950s and the 1960s, and Wilson believed society at this point had reached the self-esteem level of the pyramid. Wilson said the new killers emerging at this time were not your run-of-the-mill criminals, not even your run-of-the-mill sex offenders. He claims that the typical rapist killer is suffering from a kind of sexual starvation, and he, quote, steals sex as a starving man might steal food. But at the end of the day, he knows that what he did was wrong. The self-esteem killer, the serial killer, will never feel that what he did was wrong, and it's never his fault. He blames others. He blames society or God or the laws of nature or his parents. Sex is not a serial killer's basic driving force. What he's most interested in is power, control, self-worth. Wilson says, quote, Here, suddenly, we can grasp the reason for the sadism involved in so many modern sex crimes. The sex is inextricably entangled with the craving for self-esteem, for personal superiority, end quote. 
Wilson also says something that I find extremely interesting and important. He says, quote, Maslow's hierarchy is about human evolution, and this in turn explains why human beings are capable of so much more violence and cruelty than animals. In man, this evolutionary urge is far more acute and painful, end quote. Wilson says that in the latter part of the 20th century, the world moved into the self-actualization level, seen by an increased interest in things like the occult, the universe, aliens, psychedelic drugs, even yoga and meditation. We run into a problem here when people desperately want to reach the self-actualization part of the pyramid, but they don't have a healthy grasp on the needs below it. They don't have that self-esteem. They don't have true bonds with others. Wilson says, quote, there is nevertheless a point at which sex, self-esteem, and self-actualization mingle rather uncomfortably. The level of self-actualization is, for example, the religious level. And there are many examples of religious prophets and messiahs who are still entangled in the need for sex and self-esteem. The usual assumption is that such men are simply confidence tricksters who prey on the gullible, but this is not necessarily true. Many possess a genuine urge to self-transcendence, but still mixed with sex and self-esteem urges, end quote. Take, for example, Jim Jones, the People's Temple, you know, the guy who made his entire cult drink poison. Uh, once again, I have a multi-part series on Jim Jones. I'll link it in the description box. Jim seemed to start off his journey with genuine religious inspiration, but somewhere along the way, he got lost. And look at Charles Manson, who in the end, he blamed the violent crimes committed by his family on the society that had created them to be monsters. Manson never wavered from his insistence that the murders committed had been this violent protest against a society that denied him and the others self-actualization. He thought he was a talented musician. He believed he was going to be, you know, like the next John Lennon. But in the end, he felt that it was the world who would not allow him to be a talented musician. Therefore, the world was flawed. The world was wrong, not him. People look at you today, 20 years later, and they still have no idea what you're about. Tell me in a sentence who you are. Scar and a jug of wine and a straight razor if you get too close to me. Colin Wilson believed that as the world got bigger and people moved from agricultural communities where there was a focus on the family unit, where there was space to run and explore, where families spent time together, to more urban city environments where everyone was working, where everyone was packed in together, people who had a certain type of personality, they didn't adapt well to this change, to this shift. The Industrial Revolution changed the landscape of society. It packed so many people together like sardines in close proximity and in artificial environments away from the greenery and fresh air of natural spaces. In pre-modern societies, people lived in smaller communities. They all knew each other, and they might go months or even years before encountering a stranger. And even then, the stranger was most likely just passing through. The average medieval citizen might encounter less than 100 strangers in their entire life, but today, you and I might meet 100 strangers in a day. An experiment was done with rats, where they were placed in overcrowded situations for prolonged periods, and due to this, they developed high levels of stress, and they began exhibiting violent behavior. They also became sexually aggressive. The Industrial Revolution created a new kind of human being, one who was disconnected from the earth, from nature, and from each other. Parents needed to go to work in factories, usually both parents, and this meant that their children were either also working in factories or left at home to their own devices. No one was there to ask them about their day or help them with homework or talk about what was bothering them. This also brought a level of aimlessness and boredom to people's lives. No longer were we creating things, right? We were part of a cog in a grand machine that pumped out products. The machine was creating things, but people were working in factories. They didn't own the factories. They didn't own what they produced. They hadn't used their brains or their own creativity or their own souls to make something from nothing. So it's a completely different level of satisfaction. In fact, there is very little satisfaction in just working for someone to create something as opposed to 
coming up with an idea in your mind, creating something with your hands, selling it, making a living from it. Most people at this time could no longer even say that they'd grown their own food. This caused a disconnect from everyone and everything, and it left a lot of people with a lot of unused potential because they were just too exhausted from like 13-hour work days on the assembly line to even try and tap into new ideas or to create something with their own hands. They barely could get dinner on the table. You know, they just wanted to go to sleep, wake up the next day, and repeat it all over again. Life was monotonous. It was same shit, different day, trudging through each work shift focused on making ends meet, slowly crawling closer each day to death with no meaning and no dreams. The Industrial Revolution also opened the world up to killers who could step outside their front doors and find dozens of nameless, faceless potential victims who had no idea who they were and who would probably be lost in the mass of others who just vanished or showed up dead, never leading back to the perpetrator because they were strangers to each other. There was no connection between attacker and victim, and there was no DNA system to track this person down. Add to that, most serial killers do have some kind of childhood trauma lurking in their past. Thus, they were not emotionally evolved. Their emotional growth had been stunted in childhood, and they were unable to cope with the cold, lifeless, and disconnected world that modern life had become. For a serial killer who's searching for a sense of self-esteem, a sense of self-worth that they often are getting through other people, living during these times would have made it even more impossible to achieve these things. When you're just another cog in the machine, when you're just another of hundreds of factory workers trudging to work every day and trudging home every night, how do you stand out? How do you get that respect that you want and need from other people? Professor Elliot Layton did an anthropological study of serial killers, and he wrote the book Hunting Humans, The Rise of the Modern Multiple Murderer, which is required reading for homicide detectives in North America. I also have this book. In the 1970s, Layton, like most of the world, was transfixed by the crimes of Ted Bundy. So he was in college at this time, and he went to his university's library to read up on, like, the science of serial killers. Like, what's going on with somebody like this? But he found out there wasn't really anything written about the subject. Layton says that people are wrong to assume that serial killers are insane since they rarely display the cluster of clinical symptoms which makes up a diagnosis for mental illness. He believes instead that they represent something very dark in modern society. And he said, quote, They are not freaks. Rather, they can only be fully understood as representing the logical extension of many of the central themes of our culture, of worldly ambition, of success and failure, and of manly avenging violence, end quote. Manly avenging violence. <laughs> Layton went on to say, quote, These are not supermen. These are losers and goons, recreational killers, who are so socially incompetent that the only way they can relate to other human beings is to humiliate or destroy them, end quote. In his book, Layton examined American serial killers like David Berkowitz, Albert DeSalvo, and Ted Bundy, and he believed that these were men who felt they had been denied what they were owed by society. So they murdered people as a form of revenge, and they truly enjoyed doing so. He also came to the conclusion that a big reason for why innocent children grow up to be killers is their upbringing. He said, quote, People like these don't appear at random. They show us what happens if we ignore how our children are reared and treat our children with contempt, as modern societies more and more often do, end quote. And like I said, I'm no expert, but I've looked into a lot of these cases. I've studied a lot of killers, and I'd have to agree. I'd have to agree with this. It does seem that in modern society, there's a lot of people who treat their children like garbage. Layton found that most serial killers are middle-class men who have not achieved social success or who feel marginalized or ashamed by the success of others. But in the end, they really are just products of their environment. They were not born evil. Their fate was not to become a serial killer, and they're not so different from the rest of us. He says, quote, They should be considered as a dark and inverted embodiment of their civilization. Therein lies the special horror, for the killers are as normal as you or me, yet they kill without mercy, and they kill to make a statement. In their minds, killing is a form of social art. Their crimes are a primitive rebellion against the social order, end quote. So basically, it's not that these people didn't want to be a part of an ordered society. It's that at some point in their lives, they felt rejected by that society, and eventually they came to believe that they had no place in it. So their protest is against their perceived exclusion from society. 
These are men who have failed at something at some point, who've been made to feel as if they were failures. They've examined themselves and found that there's something lacking, and the cycle of feeling inadequate and on the outside, it continues to repeat itself, and it's only quelled by killing. Author and historian Peter Vronsky believed that the capacity to repeatedly kill is primal and intrinsic in every human. His theory is that Mother Nature intended for us all to become serial killers in the wild before civilization became a thing, and that urge is still planted deep in our lizard brains. Vronsky said, quote, Perhaps it's not that serial killers are made, but that the majority of us are unmade by good parenting and socialization. What remains behind is these unfully socialized beings with this capacity to attack and kill. And often, that capacity is grafted into sexual impulse aggression sexualized at puberty, end quote. I mean, I, I was essentially a normal person. I had good friends. I, I, uh, I led a normal life, except for this one small but very potent and very destructive segment of it that I kept very secret and very close to myself and didn't let, let anybody know about it. And part of the shock and horror for my dear friends and family when, years ago when I was first arrested was that they just, there was no clue. They looked at me and they looked at the, you know, the, um, the all-American boy. And I'm, uh, I mean, I wasn't perfect, but it was, it was, it, I yeah, want to be quite candid with you. I was, I was okay, okay? Uh, I was. Uh, the basic humanity and, and basic spirit that God gave me was intact, but it unfortunately became overwhelmed at times. And I think people need to recognize that it's not some kind of... The, 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 those of us who, are, who have been so much influenced by violence in the media, in particular pornographic violence, are not some kinds of inherent monsters. We are your sons and we are your husbands. And we grew up in regular families. Vronsky says that serial killers are anachronisms whose primal instincts are not being moderated by the more intellectual and evolved parts of the brain. However, Vronsky does not believe that this absolves them of any responsibility. He told The Guardian, quote, It is true that almost all serial killers suffered childhood trauma, but here's the problem. If 100 kids grow up in an abusive foster home and one turns out to be a serial killer, what about the other 99? They grew up to be, well, maybe not all well-adjusted citizens, but certainly not serial killers. What is the missing X factor? My sense is the responsibility falls on the offender here. Serial killers choose to act on their compulsions, end quote. Vronsky saw a pattern in the childhood of these killers. Many of them were products of the Great Depression, which saw a wave of fatherless children, whether the father had died in the war or just picked up and left the family. Many of these fathers would have been struggling financially, not able to support their wives and children. Many of them turned to alcohol in order to, you know, escape the feeling of inadequacy, the feeling of being a disappointment, the feeling of being a failure that they could no longer support their families. Some of them would go on to be abusive because of the alcohol, because of these negative feelings. The trauma that serial killers encounter between the ages of 5 and 14, it helps to shape them into what they become, which is monsters. Vronsky said, quote, you read these cases of serial killer childhoods and you have these kids who are hated by their mother and their father figure is totally out of the picture. You have kids that were abused and so essentially what happens is these kids, once they are traumatized, often their behavior becomes suspect to their peers, so other kids begin rejecting them. You find that loneliness is one of the biggest aspects reported by serial killers as children. When you're abused as a kid, there's a huge loss of control. For the rest of their lives, they are seeking to regain that control, and they are expressing it through a sexualized aggression, end quote. So it seems we have a handle on the psychological aspect, and it all makes a lot of sense. But, as Peter Vronsky said, not everyone who experiences childhood trauma grows up to be a serial killer. So maybe the physiological aspect will be that X factor that he wondered about. If the ability to murder without remorse is embedded in all of us, but some of us are able to resist it, most of us are able to resist it, maybe the answer lies in the brain of a serial killer. James Fallon is a neuroscientist at the University of California, and he has studied the brains of psychopaths and serial killers for years. He wanted to know if the brain of a killer was different from the brain of a non-killer. 
Fallon also discovered that there was some darkness in his own family line. And this guy's really interesting. So if you have a chance to look into him, it's James Fallon. He's actually like an intelligent, smart person, not like Jimmy Fallon, the talk show host, who is none of those things. (laughs) So James Fallon found out that his great-grandfather, Thomas Cornell, was hanged in 1667 for murdering his own mother. And then the Cornell line would go on to produce seven other alleged murderers, including the infamous Lizzie Borden, who James Fallon calls Aunt Lizzie. Fallon was obviously interested in this, but also a bit spooked. So he took brain scans of multiple people in his family, as well as his own, to see if any of their brains resembled the brain of a psychopath. So I'm not going to go too deep into it, but spoiler alert, his brain did. (laughs) His brain really did. And nobody else in his family's did. So there seems to be a general consensus that there's two parts of the brain that are different in psychopaths and serial killers. The part of the brain just behind the eyes, which is called the orbital cortex, it's involved in cognitive processes, you know, decision making, emotional and moral behavior. If any of you took psych courses in college, one of the first cases you would have learned about in Psych 101 was the case of Phineas Gage, who was a 19th century railroad construction worker who had an iron rod shot through his face in a freak accident. So I took Psych 101 in high school um, because I was able to pick some electives, and I picked Psych 101 and World War and Holocaust. Um, So I remember learning about Phineas Gage. It's what made me want to pursue psychology in college. For me, it was a story that showed me how complicated the human brain is, how fragile, how things can just change, and you can't really control it. So after getting shot in the face with his metal rod, Phineas Gage lived, but his personality changed, obviously. Before, he'd been like a super nice guy, dependable, honest, kind, great, you know, husband, great father. But afterwards, he was impulsive, angry, mean. He would like verbally abuse people. And the change in his personality was due to damage of his orbital cortex. In psychopaths and serial killers, the area behind the eyes is dark on brain scans, meaning there's very little or no activity. The orbital cortex also regulates the amygdala, which is the integrative center of the brain for emotional behavior, motivation, aggression, appetites. The amygdala actually does a lot. You know, this is very reductive. The amygdala, it looks like kind of like a little almond, I guess. And there's actually two amygdala, uh, one on either side. But like I said, this has to be kept very um, Cliff Notes version for, for this video or else it would be very long. So the amygdala is located in the temporal lobe. It's best known for its role in the processing of fear. So if you've heard of the fight or flight response, that's what the amygdala does. But its contribution to behavior is often overlooked and not talked about enough. It's true that psychopaths possess a certain fearlessness and self-assuredness that some of us might look at and even envy. You know, they never seem shaken or upset by things that should upset them. They always seem calm. They always seem in control of their emotions. They never exhibit any anything that would make us think something crazy was going on underneath or they're stressed or they're anxious. That's because these people have a fundamental deficit of the amygdala function and they don't have a typical fear response. All they have are impulses without their brain telling them that their impulses are wrong or even dangerous. Sigmund Freud felt that the amygdala represented the id in the human brain. Once again, we'll go back to Psych 101, and Psych 101 students will remember the id, the ego, the superego from Freud. Freud believed that the human psyche was divided into these three parts. The id is the primitive and instinctual part of the brain that contains sex drive, aggression, repressed memories. The id is impulsive and responds immediately to basic urges, needs, and desires without thinking it through. It's childlike in a way. Imagine a child saying, I don't care if I can't have this candy bar now. I want this candy bar and I want it now. There's no delayed gratification there. It's acting without thinking. The amygdala, if left unchecked, it sort of functions unconsciously, just like your heart beats without you having to think about it or or you don't have to tell your heart to beat, you know. It just does it and it keeps you alive. You know how you breathe? You don't think like every time you take a breath to get air into your lungs. You're not like, oh, I need to breathe now. You just do it without thinking about it. It's the difference between sympathetic and parasympathetic activities. When it comes to something like pleasure, the amygdala is going to be all for it. The amygdala is going to want to repeat the feeling of pleasure over and over and over again. And without regulation, 
from the orbital cortex, the amygdala is not going to care about the price of obtaining that pleasure. Now, James Fallon, who studied the brain scans of multiple people with psychopathy, says that when the orbital cortex, whose job it is to regulate the amygdala, isn't doing that, it's a really bad combination. He said, quote, what's left? What takes over? The area of the brain that drives your id-type behaviors, which is rage, violence, eating, sex, drinking, end quote. But there is another aspect in the form of gene expression. James Fallon believes he's isolated a gene that's connected to violence and aggression, also called the warrior gene. The MAOA gene regulates serotonin and dopamine in the brain. And many scientists believe that if you have a certain version of this gene, your brain will not respond to the soothing effects of dopamine and serotonin. A 2014 study conducted at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden found that the majority of violent criminals do carry this gene. It is a rare mutation, but when someone has it, it can cause MAOA deficiency or low activity MAOA. It can lead to a lack of impulse control and it can lead to violent or aggressive behavior. The condition is linked to the X chromosome, and it's recessive, and this makes it much more unlikely that a woman who has two X chromosomes will end up with it. So it's seen mainly in men. But the expression of the gene is heavily influenced by environmental factors. Dr. Rose McDermott, who has studied this gene extensively, says, quote, People with low-activity MAOA who have had a lot or more intense traumatic early childhood events are much more likely to show increased rates of physical aggression later in life, end quote. In 2006, a man named Bradley Waldrop shot a friend of his wife's eight times, and then he used a knife to cut her head open. He then chased his wife around with a machete before dragging her into a trailer after telling their children to say goodbye to mommy. During his trial, Waldrop claimed he had snapped, and then a sample of his blood was sent to a lab. The lab was told to look for something specific, a genetic variant on Waldrop's X chromosome called MAOA, and they found it. A man named Kent Keel, he collects brain imaging data from more than 4,000 criminals at eight prisons in two states, and he ended up building the world's largest neuroscience library. He found that psychopaths tend to have less gray matter in their limbic and paralimbic cortex, as well as smaller amygdalas. While scanning their brains, inmates would be asked specific questions while the computer recorded the area of the brain that was activated. A non-psychopath will show activity in regions like the amygdala, a psychopath will not. It's important to note, before we go on, many people do have this MAOA gene. Many people are even diagnosed as psychopaths, but they do not go on to kill anyone. It's important to really recognize the distinction that genes influence behavior, but they do not govern or determine behavior, right? So a lot of people have this MAOA gene, but they don't have the rare expression of it, or they just didn't have those other environmental factors leading up to kind of create a deadly combination of the gene plus these, you know, issues of childhood trauma and things like that. So in the end, since serial killers make up such a small percentage of the population, it seems to me like they are in fact created and not born. The other thing is what brain areas are turned on and off. And those brain areas control behavior and they have to do with the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe and in specific parts of it. And when those are not in balance, we have a, a, a problem situation. By themselves, the genes won't make somebody a psychopath. Or by themselves, that pattern, of the brain pattern of activation in, in certain tasks have to do with empathy or aggression or uh, getting even with somebody, uh, it doesn't make you a killer or really a full-blown psychopath. Uh, now, if the third part of this is uh, early abuse. And, and usually, in most of the dictators that you know, we've studied the lives of, and also psychopathic killers, that they almost all had, were abused very early, and the time of abuse is important. Uh, and, time and, of, of what age they are. Yeah. Which is, what is the worst? Well, the closer to birth, okay. the worse it is. All right. So if you look at the effect of environment on a child for anything, the, the key areas from the moment of birth for the first few months what's called the, you know, the fourth trimester, because humans are kind of born too early, and it helps us, uh, it me. helps in our intelligence, right? <laughs> exactly. Seems like a lifetime. <laughs> and so that fourth trimester, that's a very, very sensitive time, and that's the key thing. But that stretches out, that vulnerability stretches out from the time of birth all the way to a few years of age. After that, the effect goes, really goes down. So it's kind of like if they have the genes, 
to, and they're in the perfect balance. Right. They still need to, you still need to raise a psychopathic killer. Yeah. It seems that they are the unlucky recipients of a perfect storm of shit, basically. Maybe they do have a different brain. Maybe they have a smaller amygdala. Maybe they don't have a lot of uh, activity in their, their frontal cortex. Maybe they do have that MAOA gene. But then you add on childhood trauma, abuse, neglect, social or economic battles, poor education, poor parenting, etc. So maybe it's really a combination of all of these things that takes a human being and turns him or her into a monster, a killer who's able to portray themselves to the world like a normal, non-threatening entity. But when they close the blinds at night, they sift through their trophies, they sift through the items they've kept from people they've killed so they can relive the deed over and over while their amygdala rages unchecked. Either way, these are not people who are blameless, nor are they the victims of their circumstances, because as so many of these experts have pointed out, in the end, it's always a choice. They make the wrong choice over and over again, and they do it selfishly, because I understand it must suck. Let's say you're a serial killer and you're also like, you know, a sociopath or a psychopath, and you have a hard time feeling normal human emotions, and you see everybody around you, and they experience things like happiness and joy and excitement, and you're like, wow, I see that they... They feel this positive way, but I never feel that. I don't know what that feels like. You might want to do something over and over again if it finally makes you feel something. So I get it. But when it comes at the cost of taking another life, taking a human life or an animal's life, you're now, you're now a monster, right? So you're doing it just so you can feel something. You've placed your selfish needs to experience pleasure or happiness over the lives of other people instead of seeking help or talking to somebody or, you know, looking at porn on the computer like a normal person. <laughs> so obviously, like I said, I'm not an expert. I'm sure that it's more complicated. I'm sure there's much more to it. But I do think that this lays a nice groundwork going into our Serial Killers series about Dennis Nilsson because a lot of what we talked about today, you are going to see mirrored in his life and his actions. And like I said, his autobiography he talks a lot. It's his own words. And you can see um, areas of self-grandiose, areas of narcissism, areas of self-doubt, places where he's talking about just being lonely, wanting someone there so he wasn't lonely. He talks about childhood trauma. He talks about things that happened to him when he was small. And with all of those things combined, it's not hard to see that Dennis Nilsson fits right in to everything we talked about today. So that will be it for today. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section. Let me know if you're excited, looking forward to the Serial Killer series, or if you're not. I also have a Dark History series coming up. I haven't done one in so long. I started doing Dark History series um, on my channel, I don't know, three years ago, I feel like. I've done um, Joseph Mengele. I did Typhoid Mary. I did the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. So I have a lot of Dark History series already, but I'm doing another one. Um, it's probably not going to be until after Halloween, but I'm working on it now about the Titanic, one of my favorite um, historical topics of all time. I know so much about it, um, and I'm really excited to dive in. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm still working on Halloween. That starts next month, so there's a lot to come. Uh, remember to leave your coffee and crime time suggestions in the comments. Remember to like this video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already. And if you already have subscribed, make sure you still are subscribed because YouTube likes to unsubscribe people from my channel. It makes me feel really invalidated and overlooked, so hopefully I don't have that MAOA gene, right? And don't forget to follow my podcast, Crime Weekly. I co-host it with Derek Lavasser, who's a retired police detective. We put out new episodes every single week. You can find it where you get your podcasts from, like Spotify, iTunes, etc. You can also find it on YouTube. We post the new episodes uh, about four or five days after they go up on audio. So there are videos there to watch if you haven't watched them already. I will put all the links in the description box. But thank you guys so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I will see you very soon. Bye. Straight down And that river runs deep The mountains get steep And the voices getting too loud Oh, this feelings are very It's looking like a cemetery They're going back from the grave Calling out my name Better say I have Mary Well, you don't know How deep it goes Until it's getting you slowly And so you got To let it go I got blood